1958, Charles Elton, a famous British ecologist, said, humanity has never faced climate change of the magnitude that is happening now and is coming at us. And he predicted that the two major outcomes, the two major threats of climate change going forward were going to be conflict and migration. When he published this book, Dwight Eisenhower is the President of the United States. We now have Donald Trump, and in between, a whole range of presidents of varying political types, different parties, none of them paid any attention to this. And of course, the United States wasn't alone. Nobody paid any attention to this. Okay. The black elephant, this is a combination of the elephant in the room and the black swan. Okay, this is, this is something we didn't anticipate, but once it happened, we ignored it. Okay, and that is that biology is really central to this. It's not a matter of, let's do some physics, and then let's immediately jump to social systems. Because the reality is that climate change is created by life. If there was no life on this planet, nobody would care. Nobody would be studying, you know, no exobiologist would be from some other planet would be studying this place. And all the life on this planet is evolved life. So the story of climate change has to involve life, and if it involves life, it has to involve evolution. That's not, I'm not saying that evolution is going to explain everything. But any explanation of what's going on that does not ev involve the evolutionary history and evolutionary capabilities of life on this planet will necessarily be incomplete. In these following ways, the first thing we have to understand is that evolution is brutally short-sighted and relentless. Evolution shows us that there are severe limits to growth with great penalties for overshooting that growth that may be postponed, for example, by the development of technology, but never completely avoided. The bills will come due eventually. Evolution says that if you persist long enough, if you survive long enough, you may come up with a better way of doing things. But even if you do, the next time climate changes, that's going to be obsolete. So there's no optimal solution for anything in, in evolution. Evolutionary changes are the result of conflict resolution, not conflict and replacement. And conflict resolution requires cooperation. And finally, in evolution, the only sense of progress is survival. At, at one point at the University of Toronto, uh, nobody was getting a pay raise for many, many years. And we used to joke that, that your pay raise at Toronto was, you still have your job, don't you? Well, that's, a sense of, that's the only sense of progress in evolution. You're still alive, aren't you? You're still here. That's good. All right, so what is at risk? It's not the biosphere. The biosphere is not at risk. And this is a real problem for uh, the funding campaigns for a lot of environmental organizations because it's, they're all based on the notion that the biosphere is extremely fragile and we've just about broken it completely and if you don't send them a bunch of money, things are going to, to just disintegrate. Well, the fact of the matter is, the biosphere has been hit with far greater insults than anything we're doing to it now. And it's always been capable of regenerating itself. Lao Tzu said that new beginnings are often disguised as painful endings. And it turns out that every mass extinction event on this planet, which was due to some major environmental perturbation, has been an evolutionary reset. So here's something that, you know, if you've ever taken a first year biology class, you've seen this. So through time, we have situations in which Evolutionary diversification occurs. There's a massive environmental insult that causes a lot of extinction. Re-evolution, massive insult, extinction, re-evolution, 
and it turns out that the, the rate of rediversification is actually inversely proportional, I'm sorry, is directly proportional to the magnitude of the insult. So the worse you treat the biosphere, the faster it'll, it will evolve in response. You can't kill it. You can, unless you blow up the planet, you cannot kill the biosphere. This is good news for the biosphere. Now, here, in a nutshell, is everything you need to know about the dynamics of evolutionary diversification. If the conditions change, you run away. Alicia Stegall, who's this brilliant paleontologist at Ohio University, has, has amassed an enormous amount of information about this. It turns out that if you go back 500 million years, 300 million years, to these major mass extinction events, the species lineages that survive are the things that run away. They're not the things that stay there and heroically cope with what's coming at them. They run away and survive to fight another day. If you can't flee, you try to cope, but mostly that doesn't work. And if you can't cope, you die. And that's what all the extinctions are about. So, the title of my talk, that, that Room to Move, comes from this line, this, this uh, refrain in, a, in a, a song by John Mayo. You gotta free me because I can't give the best unless I got room to move. In other words, if you can't run away, you're not gonna survive major climate change. That's evolutionary history. Okay, now remember, in evolution, history is important, but history is not destiny. So this is what I'm telling you now is what has been the case up to this point. Here, for example, are a couple of migrants into Hungary. These are a couple of species that are running away from parts of the world where it's getting too hot for them. One is a golden jackal and the other is the Spanish slug, which my poor wife spent an enormous amount of time trying to kill in her garden in, in good this past summer. So let's look at what human beings have done, and we'll just do recent human history, so the last 150,000 years or so. Now, from 150,000 years to about 90,000 years ago, human beings experienced, lived in a period of relative climate stability. So that's this. During that time of stability, we spread out. We moved into new habitats, and we started doing new things. Among other things, we changed our diet. We started eating a lot of meat, and we started making tools that allowed us to stop being scavengers and actually start killing our own meat. Um, and unfortunately, we also realized that the same thing that we could use to kill a leopard, we could used to kill some other human that we didn't like, but that's a different story. Now, one of the things that happened with this change in diet was that human beings started to get big. We started to get bigger. And disproportionately, women started to get bigger faster than men. So in terms of body size evolution, women benefited more than men from adding meat to the diet. But this is a problem, as it turns out. That was the beginning of a problem that nobody would have realized because at that time, human population density was really low. The bigger, stronger, better fed a woman is, the bigger and stronger and more healthy her babies are. She's not gonna start having you know, babies every five months or something, but she's going to have higher quality babies. The babies are going to survive more often. Uh, we also acquired a bunch of interesting new diseases as a result of eating new things. So we have some tapeworms, for example, whose closest relatives live in lions and leopards and, and wolves and things like that. Okay, now, from about 90,000 years ago until 12,000 years ago, human beings lived through a period of not unusually great climate instability, but actually more typical climate instability 
of the record for the last three or four hundred million years ago. So that's what this is all about. Up and down, up and down, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. Cold, 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 hot, hot, hot. And during that time, we expanded geographically again. So when it got hot, we moved out there. When it got cold, we got isolated. Got hot, we moved again. Got cold, it got isolated. Every chance we had to move, we moved. Every time we moved, we added something to our dietary repertoire. We got bigger. Our women got disproportionately even bigger. Bigger, healthier women, more people, more potential for human conflict because the groups were getting larger faster because more babies were surviving. And the hunter-gatherer groups had a, a particular size and if you got larger than that, it just wasn't working very well, so the groups would split and fragment and move off. And of course, as we added new food items and, and moved into different parts of the world, we added even more diseases. Okay, and starting about 12,000 years ago, right here, what we call the Holocene, human beings experienced an almost unparalleled period of climate stability. I don't mean, it's not, it wasn't static, but it was unbelievably stable. It may have been the most stable 12,000 year period in the history of this planet, or the history of the planet with life on it. But all we know is that during the Holocene, not a whole lot was happening. We were not being hit with, with the kinds, the magnitudes. Of, of climate change events. And that's what Elton was talking about in 1958 when he said, humanity has never seen the magnitude. Modern humans have never seen the magnitude of climate change that's coming at us. And during that time, some really important things happened. That's when we developed domestication. That's when we developed agriculture. And domestication and agriculture required that you settle down. We stopped moving around. We started staying in one place. Now, as it turns out, there were a lot of benefits to that lifestyle. And during a period of climate stability, we could get away with it. We could believe that there were no costs to the benefits, that this was a life of nothing but benefits. Oh, and of course, we and our got bigger and healthier and had more people, but we became less mobile. So the p size of the social groups became larger and larger. Uh, and we picked up more diseases, and, but at the time, nobody knew about diseases, so nobody could have associated, they didn't know what, why people were getting sick, so they couldn't associate that with lots of people crowded together in one place. So by about 9,500 years ago, human beings were building fairly permanent kinds of, of, of living spaces, even if they weren't staying there all the time, okay? But they were at least not moving around freely. They would, would either be in one place forever or they would always come back to the same place. And this is really important. And between 7,000 years ago and 150 years ago, that was, again, more climate stability. And that's when we stopped being just sedentary agro-pastoralists, that's when we started creating real cities. And a, a city, a, a, it, basically what I'm talking about are, are living settlements where f a proportionately fewer and fewer people were involved in producing food. So you now had people who were doing other things. And there are all these benefits of specialization and da-da-da, and, and we know about all those benefits. The problem is that there were some some warning signs that we didn't know about because there wasn't any such thing as science at that point.
we stop moving around. We stop moving around a lot, in a sense. One of the things that meant is if we weren't moving around, that meant if we wanted more than we were producing locally, we had to trade for it. So now trade is not something, you know, some sort of special thing that happens when you happen to run into another nomadic group of people. Trade now becomes essential. And that turn, it turns out that we had been trading for a, a very long time. There's now evidence of trans-Eurasian trading routes from the Paleolithic, way earlier than that. So human beings had already been trading, but at this point, it was not a luxury. It was a necessity. And we were getting bigger and healthier, and we were getting more, less mobile. We were having more kids. Populations were getting bigger. The cities were becoming places where lots of really good things were stored. And by about 9,000 years ago, we have the first archaeological evidence of organized warfare against settlements. Because it's easier to come and take somebody else's stuff than to make it yourself. All right. Now, during this time, this is from 7,000 years ago until 150 years ago. 250 years ago. There were short but intense climate change events. Okay, when I say it was relatively stable, it doesn't mean it was flatline. There were fluctuations, of course. And, and I have heard people say, oh yes, well, don't worry about climate change because human beings have been exposed to climate change before and we did just fine. Turns out, that's a lie. Every human civilization that has been hit with a major climate change event in the last 7,000 years was destroyed forever and never returned. And this is, unfortunately, the, the lights are up, but this is a photograph of Angkor Wat at dawn. Angkor Wat was a wonderful civilization destroyed by climate change. Fluctuating flood, drought, flood, drought cycles broke the water system. And after about 30 years of trying to cope with it, the people who lived there just said, the hell with it, we're moving. And they moved about 200 kilometers away, but they never built another city like this. Same thing happened to the Mayans, the same thing happened to the Tamils in Sri Lanka. And sometime later in the 13th century, for example, that's why the Mongols left Hungary. The Mongols had a wonderful horse rider communication system, like a Pony Express system. You could be infected with plague and not show any symptoms, incubate the plague, incubate uh, uh, Yersinia for a week, which is all the time it took you to get to the capital city, Ulaanbaatar, and then you get sick. Then everybody gets sick. Then the next thing you know, all of the generals get messages from the capital city saying, a pestilence is broken out, the Khan is dead, return home. And that was the last time there was a Mongol Empire. Okay, I told you I, I would work the disease in there. All right, nobody's fault but everybody's to blame. Okay, this is a theme in, in our book that we've got coming out. So this sort of really brief history of human evolution and movement is intended to show that human beings always made decisions coping with immediate problems of the day in the way that seemed appropriate at the time. This is very evolutionary. That's why I said evolutionary, evolution is brutally short-sighted, but relentless, because we kept doing this. And as long as we weren't dead, we kept you know, solving one problem after another on a contingency basis. And in fact, until 1859, we had no scientific framework for even beginning to think about unanticipated consequences of actions. So we had no way of knowing. But what this means is that it's actually technological humanity, it's actually urbanized humanity that is most at risk. And, and this is really tough to believe because aren't we the pinnacle of thousands of years of human evolution? Don't we have the internet? Don't we have all this good stuff? Aren't we protected? Well, it turns out, 
that in the infrastructure that we created to protect us from, from the environment has actually put it at, at risk, put us at risk. That's because we changed our evolutionary legacy. We are no longer a species that runs away from problems. We're a species that stays in place and tries to cope with the problems. And we have been living beyond our means in this technological niche that we've constructed, and the bill is now due. Here are some problems with living in a modern city. Modern cities are density traps and they are connectivity traps. They are places where human beings are crowded together and they are places that only exist because of hyperconnectivity with other places. And as a result, they are extremely susceptible to a number of things, uh, one of which is, oh, disease. Okay. In 1950, 30% of human beings lived in cities. By 2050, the, this is a very conservative estimate. It's probably going to be higher than that. Um, but at least 70% of the world will live in cities. Now, between 1950 and 2050, what we have done is, in the last two generations, we have produced two generations of kids who are almost entirely urbanized children. And that, that turns out to be important going forward. So now I'm going to talk about some migration issues in the context of what human beings have done to themselves. In other words, why do we have a migration problem? The first migration problem we have is high density of human beings. A hundred years ago, this month, the Spanish influenza pandemic killed 10% of humanity. And at that time, Less than 15% of human beings lived in cities. We now live in a situation in which the human population density in influenza is a disease that is spread in proportion. It's a person-to-person -person contact thing. It's spread in proportion to population density. Human beings now, not only are there four and a half times more human beings than in 1918, but in addition, we have four and a half times the population density. Okay, so we're looking at, this is why Bill Gates is worried about the next influenza pandemic. And the other problem is, we've never been able to reconstruct the genotype of the particular strain that caused that pandemic. I mean, we've been working, we've even dug up corpses from the permafrost in Alaska to try to isolate it and haven't been able to. So we don't know where it is, what it is, when it's going to show up again. So that's one problem. And this is a problem for a city like Budapest, for example, because of migration from the countryside into the city by Hungarians. This is a Hungarian migration problem. Here's another migration problem that I showed you before. Okay? These are migrants coming into Hungary. The golden jackal from, this, from the Mediterranean, the Spanish slug from, oh, Spain. These guys carry, among other things, carry echinococcus, which can cause severe, fatal brain infections in human beings. These guys, some of you may have seen, some of you younger ones in particular, may have seen the story a, a, a week or so, or ago or so about the guy who ate a raw slug on a dare, and he got infected with rat lungworm and died. Intermediate host for rat lungworm, okay? And these are migrants, okay? So in a sense, other kinds of migration problems we're talking about turn out to be really small. This is, you know, and this is just evolution. This is just what has always happened. This is what people do, it's what animals do, it's what plants do. So we really do need to think outside the box. Climate change is accelerating. We're probably past some tipping points already. We're into this second order world. We can't afford business as usual, and inaction is not an option. 
you know, as, as Tomas was saying yesterday, if you don't know where to go, at least go in one direction because standing still in one place is, is not going to be a reasonable choice. We can't return to the past. So forget all of this back to the future crap. Besides, every woman in this audience knows that the 13th century was not a great time for women. If we return to the hunter-gatherer behavior, all of our children, my children, and grandchildren are going to die because they can't live outside of a city. The most fundamental form of psychological denial is hope. Hope is completely irrational. Hope is denial in the face of reality. I hope that guy who's pointing a rifle at me doesn't shoot me. So let's think of climate change threats as the things that came out of Pandora's box. Well, the whole story of Pandora's box was at the bottom, crushed at the bottom of Pandora's box, it was almost missed, was, this, was hope. Let hope out. And the real story about Pandora's box is that you can't cope with all the evils of the world if you don't have hope. Okay, but hope is not a plan. Hope is only a reason to have a plan. So what do we think about with respect to actually doing something? And this is the metaphor that we call anticipate to mitigate. Crisis response is too expensive. If we don't anticipate what's coming at us and try to mitigate its impacts, we're not going to be able to afford to, to, to survive. So we have to buy time. Now it turns out that we've done a lot of good things in the past 50 years that have bought us time and we have mostly pissed that away pretending that we were conquering climate change. Recycling, better fuel mileage, reusable parts, longer lasting this. Green technology, recycling, alternative fuels, all these things are really, really good. They bought us time. They probably bought us 50 years of time. And we've wasted 45 of those 50 years of extra time that we bought. And we have to stop being stupid about this. Like my real president once said, don't do stupid shit. That's not what was reported. It was reported as don't do stupid stuff. We have to buy time, and our policies have to be based on the idea that we need to survive, and in order to survive, we have to buy time to figure things out, because things are going too fast right now. Okay, so, we're an urbanized species. There are all these problems. It's made us vulnerable. Is there anything we can do about this? Well, it turns out, actually, we can, because with our technology, especially our internet technology, it's potentially possible to link together a group of cooperating small cities, each of which is sustained by a circular economy, to emulate the benefits of a big city while mitigating the problems, the vulnerabilities associated with a big city, like population density and disease, for example. And you've seen this slide before. Uh, Tomas produced it, and we actually have such a proposal in Kursig. Um, and, and I would point out also that the circular economy, of course, is, is a biological theory. Circular economy is based on analogy with animal metabolism. That's the whole basis of it. The more times you can use the energy in, in your food, the more efficient you're going to be, which means I'm really efficient unfortunately. So, we need a sense of urgency, but not panic. Okay? We need to do something. People who are panicked can't do anything except vibrate in place and be panicked. But people who don't think there's a problem won't do anything either. So, be afraid, be very afraid, but don't panic because we have a plan. And it turns out that scientists working in all areas of climate change 
actually have been following a consistent kind of protocol. It's, it's sort of emerged, and everybody is doing this in one way or another. It's what we call the DAMA protocol. Document what's going on, assess the significance, monitor things, reassess, monitor, and when you figure out what we ought to do, then act on that. The problem is that this is the actual protocol. At least this is what the scientific community thinks the actual protocol is. It's what we call the DAM protocol. Document, assess, monitor, and do nothing. And you just accumulate white papers and conference volumes about the growing problem. And nothing gets done. There's a lot of rhetoric. So one of the stories that I use because uh, I mean, I don't, want to, I don't want to own Donald Trump, but the reality is in a representative democracy, unfortunately, you do have to wear whoever gets elected for, for four years anyway. And one of my responses when people say, oh, you Americans, you know, you don't believe in climate change, blah, 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 I say, look, the president of France says that France believes in climate change. But if that were true, Paris would not have flooded last spring. Talk is cheap. The time is short, the danger is great, and we are largely unprepared. That was the message that came from a conference in Singapore two years ago where Sean and, and I, among others, spoke. But we can change that if we decide to do something. And the strange thing is the scientific community actually has some really good ideas about what to do. So it's like you have a Ferrari in your garage, but you don't have any money for gasoline. That's a very frustrating situation to be in. You'd like to be driving that Ferrari. And there are significant limits on science. The most significant limit on science is that there is no place on this planet where scientists can make something happen. There's no place on this planet where a scientist can walk into a press conference and say, we need to start doing this now, and the government says, how much money do you need for the program? Right? So, action, action requires cooperation from the rest of society. And scientists need to understand that. That's why we've been having discussions about the need for scientists to communicate their ideas and their concerns effectively. It's because they need to talk to the people who can actually make something happen. It's not like a scientist is going to convince a policy person to write a check for the scientist to go and do something. That's not the way it works. I wouldn't know how to do that by myself anyway, no matter how much money somebody gave me. So this is what we used to call in biodiversity studies, we used to call this the Jane Austen principle, that we have to replace pride and prejudice with sense and sen sensibility. And the reason that I bring that up is because the single greatest impediment we have to survival is that we will not survive if we do not cooperate with people we don't like.